And um, as I mentioned, we've got an incredible group with us here today. So we've got Rebecca Molesworth, who is a VP of Product Management at Trilla Health. Mike Barrett, who's a VP of Strategy and Development at Centene Wellcare, and Dr. Devduda Sunday, I said that right, Executive Director at Duke Connected Care. So really incredible um, folks with us here today, and, and we're going to have a wonderful, robust discussion. We're going to get started here in just a minute. Next slide. All right, so we're going to start with um, a couple of introductions. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and take a look at that um, audience poll first, if we could, and see who our folks are and, and what they're interested in. So, Sarah, could we pull up the results from the poll? All right, so who do we have on here? So what was your primary interest in joining the webinar today? So it looks like got a little bit of a tie where the speakers think value-based care is going in the future. A lot of you interested in that, and that's good because that's one of our first um, questions here today, and learning value-based care strategies from those practicing in the field, and we're definitely going to get into that as well. And then some interest in learning about how data can help me manage value-based care, and some slight interest in understanding how others have approached building um, system. Um, learning how to ensure our ACO is financially viable, not as interesting, which is in, a, a great comment in itself, um, which I think was a big question several years ago. So I see Rebecca nodding. So this will be um, interesting <laughs> discussion here today. Okay, if we go to the next slide, before we get started in the discussion, I do want to just thank um, Rebecca and um, Trella Health for supporting the program today. Um, as you all know, we are a very small um, nonprofit um, and we rely on the generosity of organizations like Trella and folks like Rebecca to support these programs. So I do want to thank them for helping us out today. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our little nonprofit eHealth Initiative, we're really a catalyst for healthcare transformation. And our mission is to convene leaders like you all on the phone today and figure out where are those opportunities for innovation. Um, we do education, thought leadership, and advocacy. Next slide. This is just a sampling of some of the different organizations that we work with. And if you do not see the name of your company up there, we want you to join us. So send me a note through the chat room and we'll figure out how we can get you engaged. Um, our goal is to have all the different sectors of healthcare involved, payers, providers, labs, uh, vendors, we'd love vendors as well, consultants, researchers, um, consumer groups, really key to our work. Um, and we want to get you involved. So please um, reach out if you don't see your organization there. Next slide. We focus on four um, areas. Right now we're looking at SDOH. We look at consumer privacy of health data. We spend a lot of time looking at virtual care. And because of the current pandemic um, over the last 18 months, we have spent a significant amount of time really looking at best practices and innovation and how that can be used with COVID-19. And we're wonderful, we're very talented at pumping out really valuable reports. A couple of the most recent reports are listed here. All of those reports are available free of charge on our website and in our resource center at ehidc.org. So I encourage all of you to take down these um, reports, pull them down, share them, um, whatever you need to do. All of that wealth of information is available for you um, and part of our mission. Next slide. And I'd be remiss if it, I did not mention, we have a really great program coming up November 3rd and 4th virtually for all of you across the country and across the globe to join us on digital health equity, um, looking at addressing the inequities and in building a modern healthcare system. And we'd love for each of you to join us. Again, this program is free of charge um, and please join us ehidc.org and go ahead and register if you have not already. Next slide. And again, thank you to Trella and Rebecca. We're glad you guys could join us here today. All right, now let's get started. This is a fun part, okay. <laughs> We've got a great group here today. So I'd love to get started just by asking each of you, if we could talk a little bit about value-based care. We've come a long way since this journey started in value-based care. You know, 
over 10 years ago, I think we started seeing the development of ACOs and, and groups and, and really trying to figure out this puzzle here. I'd love to hear from each of you, you know, what do you think some of the biggest challenges have been around um, value-based care? And um, Dev, why don't we start with you? Great, happy to. And uh, thank you, Jen and EHI for the opportunity to be here today. You know, as we reflect on our 10 year journey in value-based care, I think there are two things that are really prominent in today's marketplace. The first is around this idea of stressors. What COVID-19 has really done, it's a further stressed and already stressed system. So as we're thinking about how do we modify provider behavior, how do we include new workflows into the delivery of care, that's being done under circumstances that I think modern healthcare has never really experienced before. Providers are stressed. We all know about the labor challenges in healthcare. So trying to ask the healthcare system to do more in the context of it already doing more, I think poses a significant challenge. Because as we know, the system is built around fee for service. And if we're trying to implement workflows and design changes that are really intended to deliver on value-based care, that's gonna be seen as new and more in a system that's already facing uh, a, an unprecedented amount of new and more. If I think about the other thing that's really uh, compelling value-based care is we talk a lot about data, we talk a lot about shared savings, we talk a lot about quality, and I think those are inputs or outputs that are always gonna be important. But I think the name of the game now is efficiency. If you can create efficiency in your value-based model, I think you're likely to get better provider mind share. It goes back to the stressors comment that I mentioned earlier. If you can figure out how to get from A to B in 10 steps, which currently takes 12 steps, and in the process, deliver on value-based care. I think that's the formula that's gonna get providers engaged. There will always be the opportunity to look at a revenue minus expense shared savings model, but I think efficiency is gonna be the new currency. So excited to have that dialogue. I'll offer those two opportunities, but I'm here to learn as much as I am to speak. So thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Great. Okay, Michael, how about you? Can you share with us you know, some of the biggest challenges around value-based care that you're seeing in your organization and, and area? Well, you know, we interface, we're an infrastructure provider. Uh, and, and so we work with the providers um, on transformation. We have a pretty good idea where it's going. And so when we try to implement something new, it's, it's to, come, to Dev's point, there's a lot of stress in the system. And so it's resistance to change. One of the things that the system has to start to deal with is really doing a critical evaluation of kind of what's in the name of value-based care, what's not valuable, and stop it. If it's not valuable, stop it. Don't do it anymore. Replace it with, obviously, something that's more valuable. And the system is just so ripe with low-value activities that you know, it's, it's a challenge to wade through the low value activities and convince people to stop doing those things because they've always done it that way. And they don't know why they did it that way, but they, they do it that way. And to adopt a, a new way of doing something. Um, so uh, some of that is pure process. A lot of it is uh, linked to, am, am I going to be able to sustain my, especially when you're talking with clinicians, my payroll to my next payroll. How, how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to, how is my organization going to be economically sustainable? And what's, what's the economic path forward? And so there's this transition from um, motioning the machine faster and faster and faster. You know, how many office visits can I get done today versus intervening on a case where you avoid a hospitalization and feed that feedback loop to Yes, you avoided that hospitalization, saved the system $15,000 or something, and here's the money for it so you can make payroll. Right? Closing that loop, that's, that's a big frustration for us. Rebecca, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I get the benefit of going after two very smart people, so I'm going to say, I totally agree with you and forgive me for sort of co-opting some of your thoughts, but I think it really becomes about sustainability and transparency. And I, I agree with you, Dr. Sangbe, about the sustainability, not just in terms of sustainability business-wise, which is obviously very important in my you know, conversation with you about you know, the, the need to keep 
the you have to make payroll, right? Like this has to be a sustainable business, but it also has to be sustainable in terms of delivery as well. And uh, I think clearly in both spaces, we're struggling. And then with transparency, you know, in full transparency, Trello Health is a data company or a data analytics company. So, you know, to us, providing the transparency out to the market about what's actually happening, what is value, Based care, like what the, what are the valuable services we're delivering? What are the services we just think are valuable? And who's providing valuable care? And who is providing care that is you know patterned and and more fee for service oriented than in a value based care world that's appropriate? So I think if we can have some sustainability and transparency, the model can continue to work and evolve. If we don't have those things, I think we have the same situation we had way back in the '90s, where you know we had HMOs and 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 didn't work because we couldn't see what was happening and we couldn't, we just saw the cost go up at the end. You're on um, mute. I'm mute here. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, when I look back at kind of um, value-based care and I think about ACOs, I think about how far we've come and, and we were kind of idealist, I think at the beginning in terms of how this was gonna roll out. And um, I'm just kind of, you know, you always have the benefit of 2020 hindsight, but I'm just, Curious in terms of your perspectives, you know, what have we really learned about it over the last decade? You know, what were we kind of um, naive about? Um, you would just love your thoughts on that. Deb, uh, Deb, you wanna go first? Sure, I'm happy to. You know, I think I'm gonna probably repeat a lot of what I said in my opening comments is, I think what we've learned is that uh, in order to really get providers on board, you have to make more than an economic case. I mean, hmm. in some cases, the economic case makes sense. And we know that there have been a lot of ACOs, or at least a handful, that have performed remarkably well. Let's say, for example, in the MSSP program, where the uh, financial rewards really outpace anything you would have earned in a fee-for-service space. But for a lot of ACOs and a lot of these models, that's just not the case. And so to uh, really compel doctors and other providers to, to change the way or redesign the way they deliver care, you got to give them more than just a financial model. Because I think what we've perfected in healthcare, the royal we, is we can really run the fee-for-service engine as long and as hard as we want. And anytime mm. we find a stressor, we just find a way to get another 10% out of that system. Uh, what we really got to figure out is, is how we really change the system in a way that the answer to every financial stressor isn't let's just do more fee for service, but actually redesign care. Yeah, great point. Rebecca, any thoughts? Yeah, I, well, I have a couple. Um, one is when the program was uh, starting, I was coming out of grad school, just gotten my, you know, my MPH and I was ready to go save the world. And I loved the ACO program from the beginning because it was trying to flip the delivery system in a way that was positive. Um, I think watching those early ACOs launch, they had a lot of them were hospital-based because they had the financial means in which to balance this out. I think what I see now is much more creative, sustainable models in terms of the financial models to be able to make a business, you know, be able to pay the physicians to be able to have the care that we need to deliver. And I think that's been sort of a, you know, a reality that has uh, had to evolve in the market. I mean, we, we came in thinking we're going to change the world. And I think we still are kind of going up that, you know, that roller coaster um, and we haven't quite landed it yet. So I think we have a lot more to learn. I think I'll, I'll borrow from um, Mike Levitt. He, he said in a meeting I was in once that uh, we're halfway through a, a 40 year healthcare transformation. I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that having the longevity, um, we have opportunity there. The other thing that I would say just quickly is I think I also learned the hard way that um, that patient accountability is part of this. And it's the hardest part of the, of the whole equation to, to control, if you will. The people who vote for our politicians are the very people who you know, would like to have as much care as possible and have as good care as possible and as, as free care as possible. Um, <laughs> And this transformation has to go through the whole system, not just at the provider level. It has to, it has to imp impact how we think about value as consumers of healthcare as well. So that's, that's on all of us, you know. Yeah. Michael, you wanna jump in? Sure, um, so value and the lessons learned. One is having realistic expectations on change management and really paying attention to change management. So let's, let's look at what is achievable over what time period and how fast we can cycle that. But you know, as you go into that question of what is achievable, achievable, I'll go back to uh, something Dr. Sangvai said. 
you got to engage the providers. And the very first thing that we learn is you have to really explain how it is safe for the beneficiary. You know, it, it cannot put Jeopardy into the system. That's a non-starter. And so you have to touch that base first. Um, and then after you touch that base of it is a safe thing to do, here's all the clinical research that it says it's safe and so on and so forth. Um, and then it has to be explained by a clinician. You know, I'm a, a finance guy by background, and, you know, I can carry that bucket of water only so far. Um, uh, it, it really has to be done at that clinical to clinician to clinician level with experience, with understanding. And the one of the things that, that we adopted in a lot of our ACOs, we kind of got rid of the total line on our report. Our reports have a lot of average lines, and we structure the report so that those providers in that local geography that are helping success show up on the top half of that. Those providers that are a drag and, quote, hurting show up on the bottom. And it's so that we can actually engage the providers, you know, Dr. Barrett, Dr. Smith, you're both here in West Podunk. This isn't mythology. This isn't California. This isn't some far off place. This is right here in Podunk. Here's this variance in outcome. Let's sit down and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and really, and, and I'm not saying this because there's peer pressure, but there's peer acceptance. Yeah. You know, that, that type of, uh, that's, that's what we see is probably the biggest lesson we learned in this thing is how to do change management in a peer environment. What about some, you know, specifics about, I, we've got a great question here, Michael, what things were, were not valuable. So Dev, I'm kind of interested, um, you know, if you could go back and tell yourself 15 years ago, don't waste time, don't do this, don't spend time on what, what would you tell yourself? That's a really good question. Yeah, you know, if I had to go back and think about things we would have done differently, I think one of them would have been to uh, it really goes back to what Michael said earlier. What are the expectations? And I think setting expectations on actually getting better clinical outcomes, setting expectations on making, uh, if you will, bringing the joy back in medicine, both for patient and provider, uh, and not focusing as much on uh, ROI and the like, I think um, might have been a little bit easier to lay the ground, the initial groundwork that you can then build on and then look to get that return on investment because I think you really have to build the system. The challenge, of course, uh, even as I you know, replay in my mind now from 10 or 15 years ago is, is you're still up against uh, the realities of which care, in the which reality of the way in which care is currently delivered, which is that fee for service model. We've all built our systems around that. And so you're asking individuals to change that while you're actually living that. And we've heard all the different kind of analogies we can make about changing the tire on the car while the car is going down the highway and so forth. <laughs> but that's, that's really part of the challenge. And again, you're doing it in, um, in a setting that's really got a lot, very little reserve in a number of different ways. So, um, you know, my immediate reaction is, is just kind of going back to what Michael said, you know, what are you really trying to achieve here and try to scope that uh, in a way that has a long vision as opposed to maybe a one or two year ROI kind of vision. Michael, thoughts? What would you tell yourself so not to do? <laughs> right. I'm gonna try to answer this at like two levels. Um, one level is real office process, right? We work at what patients really need to see a doctor versus mm -hmm. those that really don't need to see a doctor, right? Top mm -hmm. of license kind of stuff. And it's not so much for productivity of how many CPT codes you can turn out, but it's really what patients have the complexity of the condition that the doctor needs to make some decisions and, and then hand off to an expert on how to achieve that. Um, I have a term called the intimate moment when the, the patient is looking at the clinician and then saying, what's best for me? You know, that's, that's a clinician event. That's not a layperson event. Our job is to make sure that the information is there, all it can be at that moment, that moment happens, and then grab all of that and action it. And uh, I used to ask the question when I would present to primary care physicians, especially in a Medicare environment, how many of you know the telephone number to Meals on Wheels? Mm -hmm. And if there was 100 doctors in the room, maybe one would raise their hand and 
half of them would kind of look at the floor and kind of think they were supposed to know that. And I would say, actually, you're not supposed to know that. You're supposed to know that if you have nutritional concerns, I'm a social worker, highly trained in getting that done for you. You need to know that. So you don't have to do it all. You need to know when to call on your team because, you know, historically, most physicians are, you know, in the surgery room, they, there's a team leader, right? But outside of that, there's not a lot of team play in, in medicine and how to hand off care. So I would say, you know, learning how to valuably manage your time to do mm-hmm. the things that only you can do and really hand off the team to better experts in patient education, right? Yeah, no, I think that's so a great those, point. Right, yeah. so um, a doctor seeing a cough and cold, you know, no, that's not a very valuable thing, yeah. right? To, to be specific to the question. Yeah. You know, moderating between uh, diabetes and uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, hypertension, yes. That, mm-hmm. that needs some more more weight. Rebecca, one of the things we hear a lot about and that I think we've learned is the issue around reliable data and just, you know, people don't have it. (laughs) And, um, you know, what are your thoughts in terms of what are some things that you've seen in the field that have really worked um, in terms of addressing kind of the biggest blockers to reliable data? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know, CMS is trying to instigate that with the laws that are coming out to try to keep people from data hoarding because you know the silos of data have always been a problem. We try to take a whack at it with HIEs to try to break down some of those silos and to more or less success, depending on what part of the country you're in and, and, the, and the willingness of the community. I think um, now that data is starting to become unlocked more, it's about how do you start to amass the data in a perspective that allows you to actually make decisions, right? And, and so, you know, each data set has different value. Um, one of the things that we think about a lot at Trella is, is getting out of the echo chamber, of getting out of your own data silo that you create. If you're a provider organization, your tendency is going to be to use the EMR data, but you don't have then the longitudinal view of the patient or how you're performing compared to others. Um, we think about, you know, the CCLF data that CMS has made available, it's helpful We actually, you know, Trello, our job is let's look at the whole market, right? Let's see what the whole market is doing in Medicare fee-for-service, not just the ones that you're touching. So I think it really is about how do you get beyond the walls of what you're doing and getting the data can be very challenging. I think it's getting more available. I mean, we've recently acquired a bunch of data from the switches, you know, through another uh, you know, helpful vendor who's helping us get access to commercial claims and various other mm-hmm. kinds of claims. So we're starting to aggregate those data sources and then making them available to people to use. And, and um, data science can be hard. It can be hard to make the data accessible. I mean, you get all the data, you put it in a warehouse, but then you, you can't just go in and say, show me all the diabetics who, who didn't come see me last Tuesday very easily, right? You have to know how to manage that data. So one of our missions is to help make that data more usable for people. Um, And we do that through using the fee-for-service database that we have an innovator's license through with CMS. So we're able to access all of CMS's data so we can start to share with people, here's how you compare to other providers. Here's other providers in your area you may not know that are there. You don't have a relationship with them and they're great providers and you you don't know that they're out there. Um, So I think more of us who are out there trying to create more transparency in the market in general help the problem. I also think that you know, some of the stuff CMS is doing to try to stop the, the data hoarding is, is gonna be important because without it, you know, we're not gonna get very far because data is power, it very much is. And, and people have been using that power in healthcare in a, in a not very helpful way. Well, let's talk about the data hoarding or data sharing actually is what we, we want. So <laughs> yeah, let's try to be positive here. So, you know, how do you, what do you expect in terms of data sharing agreements? And we've got a great question here. Um, how is that going to be a part of future value-based care arrangements possibly? Dev, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I want to um, reiterate what uh, Rebecca mentioned because it's right on. It's just not about the data, but making it usable. And I might even take it one step further and say, yeah. how do you make it usable at the point of care? And if your point of care is a back office that's helping run your reporting, that's a different type of data need versus the data need that you might have if you are a provider who's uh, delivering care. So you need data use agreements that allow you to integrate this into whatever platform you use when you're delivering care and then make it available at point of care. 
you know, a great example also, I think you see a question in the chat around price transparency and utilization yeah. management. You know, a good way to consider data would be um, taking all the data you have on price transparency and UM and then making it available to the provider when they're getting ready to prescribe the medication. And so how that might look is you choose, you're thinking of choosing between one or two different drugs. Uh, part of it is going to be what's clinically efficacious, and that's going to be your primary driver. But then ultimately, you want to figure out what's going to make the most economic sense for the patient. And there are multiple variables that go into that. What's on formulary, what's not, who is the PBM, where the patient sits in the context of their deductible, uh, and so forth. If you can take all those data points and make it immediately available and then signal the provider the right way to say, among all the medications that you're considering, try this one because it meets on all of those metrics. It's on formulary. The patient's not allergic to it, for example. It's going to meet clinical outcomes. And by the way, based on where they are, let's say in the middle of September and they're deductible and so forth, for the next 90 days, this is the most affordable choice. Yeah. That's where I think all those data points need to come in and then deliver it immediately at the point of care. And if you succeed there, then you succeed in your value-based care outcome as well because you see how that's going to also be um, the, the right amount of spend relative to choosing an expensive drug when a, a, a less expensive drug is available. And you can just kind of extend that to a variety of different things that we do in the delivery of care. So uh, it's data, but it's about getting that data immediately at the point of care. So one of the things that I think the price transparency is a great question, and, and thanks for um participant who asked that today. So Michael, I mean, one of the things we've heard is this is great at the point of care to know is that drug more expensive than this drug or which one is covered. Um, but one of the things we've also heard is that, you know, sometimes this isn't something that the clinician necessarily, um, a role the clinician takes on. So I'm just kind of curious, what's kind of the, um, how do we make that happen and where, you know, where is at the point of care? Is that where that should be shared? And, and how does this work? How do you make it all work? Because it's a I great think, piece um, of data. Right, so that was a really good example of that, all that information at that yeah. intimate moment, right? Fantastic, I'm gonna borrow that. Um, and, and then the, the next step is education. You know, most physicians, I refer to them as scientists. They, they are data-driven, they are education, they've been through years and years of education. So um, you, you don't tell them what to do, you tell them why, right? You, and you don't so much tell them as you inform them. And, and this is an educational process. Uh, so data comes into it in two ways. How many opportunities do you have to apply this new uh, pattern, right? If, if uh, uh, and that's the other part of our reporting is, you know, here's Dr. Barrett, they have the most occurrences of some substandard outcome process, we should focus with Dr. Barrett first. Um, the other side of it is, is, what is a process that is not working? What is a process that's broken? So you have, a, I'll call it the application at the micro level, but the determination, the fil filtering and sifting of, you know, this community, you know, we operate ACOs all around the country. This community, you know, I describe it as we have more than one of everything and two of nothing, right? They're really good on in-stage renal. Their their costs are sixty thousand dollars per year, which is you know bottom of the market. And other ones at one hundred twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. Well, let's yeah. go. We need the data as to how do those patterns differ. Engage with the clinicians and understand what can be changed for market A to start resembling market B. And that's all education. And that comes, we find that in the data. Yeah. We don't yeah. resolve yeah. it within the data, but we find it in the data. Rebecca, I want to just give you, because you guys have the data, so. <laughs> we have some of it. <laughs> so yeah. so I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about kind of the data that Trell, I know you've got a, a couple of slides we could probably them up. If you'd like, I can. I don't need okay. them. Okay, or you don't need them. Okay. Do. I, I, um, yeah, I'd be happy yeah. to talk a little bit about it. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, um, it, I think it was in 2016, um, met with CMS and became it, through a process of two years of work, um, an innovator uh, have an innovator's license to the CMS chronic mm -hmm. condition warehouse. So that means we have access to 100% of part A and part B data. Um, and it's usually lags four to five months. So it's one of the trade-offs. We have all the data, 
in terms of Medicare fee for service, A and B, um, but it has a little bit of a lag because it's all been normalized and standardized and we can really start to work with it. Um, the VRDC is the sort of shortcut name for virtual research data center. Um, they also have a lot of other data sets. So we have access to Medicaid data. We have access to Part D, but it, it lags. Um, we have access to Medicare Advantage, but it lags. And so we have a lot of access to CMS's data. And by doing this database, uh, they were trying to break down silos, I think, for people who wanted to do the right thing with the data. Um, we had to apply. We have people who are certified who are allowed to go into that database calculate things and then withdraw the results to be able to share. Um, we recently became a QE um, and that means we had to have a significant amount of data in all 50 states were a QE for um, across the country um, in order to be able to qualify to get all that data in our warehouse. And so we would have access to the actual claims lines in our own warehouse, which allows us to do much more dynamic reporting. Um, we can do, you know, we can do predictive models. We can do all sorts of interesting things across the whole Medicare database. And we start talking about how do you create benchmarks and how do you create an opportunity in them for people to understand how they're performing. Um, those large data sets can be very helpful. The data that we don't have access to is all the clinical streams that come through that, right? So there's the there's a big piece of the puzzle that has a lot of value that's missing. Um, that said, the QE project is all about how do you start to bring data sets together. And so by demonstrating we had such a vast amount of data around the country, we're able to start aggregating that data into the QE environment and starting to create more linear views, log longitudinal views of patients and providers. And a lot of the work we've done has been really about helping providers and being around um, understanding how providers are performing, helping them see you know, the practice patterns across different parts of the country, all of the sorts of things that Mike was discussing actually just moments ago. Deb, I'm interested, you know, this issue of the lag time keeps coming up. <laughs> so how do you deal with that, you know, as a provider? I mean, how do you get at the most, you know, you've got old, it's not old data, but, la you know, data that's lagging. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the, the data that are often most lagging that providers are not going to have access to is the financial performance data because, Mm -hmm. Those are the, the data uh, points that come from payers, and those are the ones that payers uh, ultimately use the claims process to help generate. Uh, so there is always going to be that lag. Uh, but in many cases, what you're really focusing on is the clinical performance, because you're going to have the necessity to focus on your uh, clinical metrics and the like. And most of those you should be able to extract out of your EHR. Some of it you can even do manually, depending on the size of your population and the size of whatever entity might be in an ACO. Uh, and then it's the reconciliation. It is going to be lag. That's a blind spot. I mean, we know that. We know that even on a December 31, you often don't know how you've performed in that year until March or April of the following year. I think spending a lot of time trying to develop proxies for uh, what you mm. might get out of a claims uh, run or out of a claims report, I'm not sure how beneficial that is just because you just never really know the one area um, that you may know and where claims data become less important is if the majority of the care that your assigned patients are receiving are getting it within the context of your own ACO or your own system, there's a way to use outbound claims data and other data to kind of think about where you might land in that overall cost picture. But that's tough. You know, you need a system where basically everything is airtight uh, and you're not letting care go out of your system, which may be possible depending on how you're structured and, and, and from the geography perspective. Um, but I think, you know, to the extent that you have claims lag, you're going to have a little bit of a blind spot on financial performance. But because clinical performance is just as important, you'll be able to get that out of your EHR. That's, I think that's actually a really important point. I'm sorry, I'm jumping in, but I, no, I think please. that's actually a really important point because I this is going to sound like, you know, I don't know, um, inappropriate for a data minded data analytics person to study, but as sexy as ML and, and predictive models are, there, there is a place in time for claims analysis that you can't, as Dr. Dev, uh, Dr. Sange said, you can't get that out of the clinical streams as accurately, right? Looking at cost and looking at trends um, and often looking at uh, trending data where you're looking at, at how physicians have been performing for years. I and mean, physicians have been practicing for 25 years 
aren't going to change up their practice patterns the next month dramatically. So you can start to see patterns of behavior, patterns of cost trends, patterns of utilization, uh, patterns of quality and, uh, and clinical outcomes, although not as well as you can in the, cl in the clinical streams. And then you have the clinical streams where you get the ADT feeds to say, my patient just transitioned to another setting of care and I need to act now. Um, those are really important too. And so I think there, we, we can't be judgmental of our data sources. They all have their purpose and their value. And I think that the, the nirvana world is when they start to come together and, and work together to make the information available and then getting it, as Dr. Uh, Deb said, getting it to the point of care where you can actually do something with it. Um, I think the claims data is great for saying what happened. I think the clinical data is, is really good for saying what's going to happen or what happened now. I love that. I love that quote. <laughs> I made it up. You can have it. That's great. We'll take it. We'll take it. Okay, I've got to ask this question because we've got five people asking this question. So, Michael, Dev, um, for those who are new to value based care, trying to get into that model, what programs and measures should they start monitoring? What do they do first? So, give me, you know, what are the three things you do first? Michael, you want to go first? Um, yeah, so hyper tactical, hyper micro. Um, if 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 I were launching a, a, a new program, uh, January first, the very first thing I would do is find out who was admitted in the last ninety days, because hmm. that's incredibly highly predicted that they're going to get admitted again within the next six months. And, and you know, you know, I'm just turning on the lights. I have limited data sets. I'm going to go find out who's been admitted recently because chances are they have a, a, a very high chance of being admitted again. And it's a small enough number of people that I might actually be able to do something, hmm. right? So we actually had a, a program called 90-90-90. What's uh, the 90% of the people who have a 90% chance of being admitted in the next 90 days? Huh. And but. go find them, talk to them, motivational interviewing techniques, find out what is broken in their healthcare support system, right? And start fixing it, right? Um, so that's gonna be your economic process. It's also gonna teach you an awful lot about where your healthcare system has gaps and holes, right? Love it. And, and right, so filling in those gaps and holes are gonna be valuable. So that's, you know, if you're really brand new, hyper, tactical, very short term, that'll get you going. I love that. Dev, how about you? What's, what do they do first? Yeah, and I think, you know, my response in many ways is going to be similar to what uh, Michael just mentioned. Uh, if you have identified an area where you have variation in care that doesn't make sense, that's a good place to start. And here too, um, at, at some point you're going to validate, but just working with your clinicians, whether they're physicians, nurses, or other members of the healthcare team, and asking them, what is it that you're witnessing in our office, in our practice, in our group that just doesn't make sense? It could be Dr. A's patients stay in the hospital for five days every time they're admitted for pneumonia and Dr. B's stay for three days. If you look and you ask even that question to clinicians, who are your 50 patients that you know are just gonna end up in the hospital in the next 90 days despite everything you do? You've done that first data cut that Michael had just mentioned then you're gonna to wanna to validate. And that's where I think entities like Trello and others come into the equation. If you don't have the in-house capability, validate that a bit. And close enough is oftentimes good enough in this first set. Uh, and then as you think about um, where you have that variation, let's say it's in heart failure admissions, trying to then understand why that variation exists. You wanna set benchmarks or at least one benchmark and then implement one or two initiatives. Maybe it's uh, post-discharge phone calls, uh, maybe it's meds to beds or anything like that. Uh, and then I think it's true in, in, in any enterprise. If you can't measure what you're doing, then you really got to ask yourself why we're doing it. So continue to measure. And then, <laughs> you're not managing it. Exactly. And so, you know, you can use your PDSA cycles or anything else to be able to do that. And I think that's the framework for anyone who really wants to go into the VBC space as well. I know that question has come up in the Q&A. What do you tell somebody who's kind of new to the game? Is find those one or two areas that you know that either through your own internal benchmarking because they're really some high performing entities or as you compare yourself to others where you think you can perform better uh, and then figure out how you can actually implement the change. 
if you want to get the financial rewards, you're going to need a payer partner to be able to do those. But most payers, I think, in most geographies now are familiar enough that they will likely come to you with a model that they've already implemented in, in other parts of your geography and ask you to engage in that model. But the, the inputs and the outputs are the same. Yeah. Rebecca, I mean, you really are, I think, um, sharpest, you know, know a ton about this data piece. Um, can you talk about some of the things that you have seen out in the field in terms of, you know, what the people do first? Um, well, we have a very specific point of view, I think, in, in, in what we're doing right now. I've, yeah. I've looked at other organizations, obviously, but in, in the organization that I work at in Trella, um, we're there trying to help our customers understand the market they're in first. Like, you know, you have a geographical area in mind, you have, uh, you know, a set of providers in mind. Let's help you understand the baseline of that market. Because if you don't understand the market you're in, you have no idea how you're performing in that market, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing we do a lot of work in is helping them with their network. So Trello has a long history of post-acute care as well as the work we've been doing with ACOs and DCEs. And so we know that that site, that whole ecosystem very well in our data sets. And so folks who are looking to find SNPs to partner with and downstream um, partners after they've found their primary care, which is always number one. They, you know, they need to start looking at how do you manage the whole value chain, not just the primary care physician. They're the ringleader or the quarterback, if, if you will. But you've got, you know, the specialists that are engaging and, and helping people start to spread their wings out and understand those different uh, areas of their practices and who they're partnering with and how they can actually manage the cost of care, even down to end of life, which is a really hard place to have conversations, but where a lot of cost and variability happens in, in the outcomes that folks are um, driving with the utilization. I've got a couple questions here. So, um... If you guys knew the answer, I want you to just jump in here. So <laughs> how are any of you using ADT admission discharge transfer data now that CMS is requiring hospitals to send those? Are any of you even able to get those types of alerts? So we, uh, uh, we, we uh, have, go ahead, Michael, please. I would say we, we have a, a bunch of geographies and, and well over 80% of our geographies we're already getting ADT feeds directly from hospitals that are high volume hospitals. Mm -hmm. and, and we use them as points of intervention, right? Uh, someone shows up at the hospital, okay, we need to do something. They're gonna be discharged or transferred, we need to do something. Um, trying to get uh, something installed, you know, if, if you look at like a, an admission, it's highly likely to be some sort of a failure to maintain health, then we use that as a trigger of where did we fail? Um, and Quite often, the answer is first step one: get them back to their clinician. So, if the average length of stay is four days, schedule an appointment for day five and six. Right, eighty percent of the cases are going to be discharged by that time period. Get them back to their clinician as quickly as possible. Inform the the clinician because chances are they're not getting information, and let them do their clinical thing but at least tell them it existed, right? So uh, that's how we perceive ADT fees. Yeah. Um, our use is largely the same. It's this idea that if you get an ADT signal on a patient that you're following for one reason or another because they're in your care management program or they've been identified as high risk, it just gives you the opportunity to intervene earlier uh, even, you know, the most smoothest discharges uh, in the occur over the course of half a day or in some cases a full day. Uh, if they occur over the weekend, you're really waiting two to three days before there's a signal back to the outpatient team that something occurred in the inpatient space. So you really get the early signals with an ADT, but you need to build the infrastructure and programs to do something with that because nothing is more frustrating than to say your patient's at hospital X. Um, and you really know that they're going to get discharged tomorrow, but you don't have a way to meet their needs once they're in the outpatient setting. Uh, so again, it's just this balance of how much data you get and then what can you really do with that in a way that's going to have measurable impact. I could tell a story about Please. a client I had once upon a time. Please. First will remain nameless, but they were taking on as much risk as they could. So they were a provider organization taking on a ton of risk, including their own population. Um, and they were using care management, care transition coordinators to try to help get the members to where they needed to be at the right time. They used ADT 
um, especially within their own system for these early intervention alerts. But their goal, the metric they were measuring themselves by was could they get to the ED with a phone call from a care manager before the patient saw a doctor? So someone who has CHF who suddenly started gaining a lot of weight, they didn't take their meds regularly, so now they're having crisis. They were literally trying to get to that ED and say, we know Rebecca, we know her, you know, we know who her primary care doctor is, we know what meds she's on, let us help you manage her and see if this is the appropriate care setting, first of all, and if it is, then get her into, you know, just start discharge planning basically at that moment for whatever, you know, the, the, the project was. It was a high standard, but they measured themselves by it. They actually tracked whether or not they were doing that. And so it was, and I just thought that was fantastic because that talk about putting your money where your mouth is in terms of using those ADTs to their maximum efficiency is really within an hour getting to the ED before that patient's even seen. That's great. And they, were they able to be successful with that? They were. Um, they saved, they did an ROI analysis and actually got their savings. And I'm trying to remember the number. I'll, I'll misquote it so I won't say it, but they actually made significant savings just on that process alone, implementing that process in their care management. And this is a provider who was essentially becoming a payer and was starting to use um, some of the, the capabilities and processes that payers have in place in order to manage utilization with the, I would say, the the nursing quality of caregivers, you know, with the, with the compassion and humanity of caregivers. So there's a really interesting organization. So we've got an interesting question here about which type of organization is better positioned to drive value-based care. I'm assuming it would probably depend. <laughs> um, but I'd love to hear kind of the, the argument for both. Um, so um, uh, Michael, why don't you start? Well, I'm going to tell you the, the very best thing or person or entity position to drive value-based care is a primary care physician. They're the ones on the very front end of this uh, exercise, and it, they're the ones who start the, the ball rolling, have the best point of intervention. So I, I kind of lean that way. Um, I typically am a uh, physician advocate, uh, often retur- referred to as a PCP zealot. Um, although I work for a, a payer organization uh, at, some, at some high level, Centene is a payer. Um, and the, by the time someone's significantly ill and they've hit this, the claim system quite a bit, we have plenty of opportunity to intervene, get a plan going, and start executing on that plan. If there was a question earlier about rising risk. You know, that's where your engagement with the clinicians really starts to pay off. Who are you concerned about? And, you know, was a, a, a paraphrase of a, a point that Dr. Sandai uh, uh, put out there. Um, and, you know, that's where it's all happening as far as, as I'm concerned and we're concerned is really at that primary care patient beneficiary interface. So, and, and enabling all of that, right? Yeah. Deb, I'm kind of interested in how you think value-based care might change the relationship actually between providers and payers. You know, I'm actually a, a little bit hesitant to say anything. Someone just <laughs> said, someone just congratulated uh, primary care providers. And as a primary care doctor myself, I had to just leave it at that and not say anything more. Um, um, especially since it came someone who leans more payer. That's a, that's a, that's a big win. No. Uh, oh, you know, I think it I'm a big if, PCP zealot. <laughs> So if you're, uh, you know, to the extent the VBC model is one that's largely financial, I think the uh, advantage goes to the payers. They have the data, they have the systems that have been set up to do that, and they can actually, quite frankly, take on any economic risk right now. If value-based care transitions to something that's more operationally driven, then I think the balance shifts more to the provider side. Because in the end, there is no care that's delivered that ends up as a claim that didn't result because some clinician somewhere said this care needs to be delivered. And that's a pretty powerful tool if you think about that. So all the data that's going into the payers is love because someone is making a clinical decision to say this needs to happen or you need this medication or we need to do this procedure. So that ability to control things operationally is pretty powerful. It's gonna take a while I think for it. So it goes back to that 40 year journey. You know, Maybe it'll, it'll be the next 20 years we'll start to see provider systems and providers, even, you know, the, the small practices really kind of embrace that idea of the decision they make ultimately relates to that claim and that value-based performance. 
So I think it's a bit of a balance. And now our relationships in value-based care, the ones that have really been most successful are the ones where payer and provider come to the table together. Um, mm-hmm. This really isn't a scenario where I think you can say, you know, in the end, you know, there's, there's a victor because you, you really need that balance between both entities to be successful. Yeah. Rebecca, this question's been sitting up there for a while. Are, can you think of any real world examples where there have been immediate incentive payouts to providers for some divine quality activity? Story, I swear that, the story that comes to mind probably isn't the one you want to hear. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was talking. Now we really need to hear it. <laughs> well, so I was talking with uh, some ACOs and, and some ACO leaders of established that these were MSSPs, ACOs. So the, those were the roles by which they were playing. Um, we were talking about you know, sort of incentives and where they come from and how you can incentivize physicians. And one of the things they said to me that was really, I thought, just interesting was they were talking about specialists and they said we've discovered that it doesn't you you go to an orthopedist and you say hey I'll give you you know 200 bucks for doing a really good knee surgery they would actually this is an incentive program they had implemented they would rather hand the the um the specialty office a body you know hire someone for them to manage some of their paperwork and their submissions for the ACO in order to give them you know freedom and time back in their lives because no, no orthopedic surgeon wants to get out of bed for $200. But if you will give them a person for $120,000 that will support their office and take some of the pain out of their life, that was an incentive they were very interested in. And I thought that was just really an interesting way to think about where, where's the incentive, like what is the incentive for the person you're sitting across from? And, you know, the PCPs have a different incentive level than some of the subspecialists and, and what will make their, their lives better might be different. And you're not going to write million dollar checks to every orthopedic surgeon you need to, or, you know, you need to have services done from, but you can add value and it may not be just a dollar amount. Jeff, what do you think about that as a representing a physician yes. here? You know, um, <laughs> I think that this idea of early wins and incentives, some of the pay for reporting uh, from the old days really kind of achieved that. And even the pay for performance achieved that. But, you know, as we think about data and technology, uh, if there is an entity like a payer that's going to provide a provider or a provider group some incentive because they achieved some benchmark, whether it's uh, closing gaps in care like you may have for HCC or whether it's reaching some milestone with respect to pediatric vaccination. We know that that process of payout comes through a reconciliation process. And we talked about that earlier, how it can take several months at a time. Wouldn't it be great if we can bring the Venmo level technology to this to say provider, we have, we have validated, we've done everything compliant and we know you've met that target in September of 2021. And so we're just gonna pay you out now for that performance rather than wait till a long delayed process, which is probably gonna take eight months down the road uh, and then end up um, giving the exact same result. You could put checks and balances into the system. You'd have to run it through a couple of compliance engines and so forth. But if you shorten the time period between provider action and payout, I think you start to see some opportunity to say, hey, this really makes sense. Because once you get that lag, everything just becomes so opaque. Providers have a hard time knowing I did do these five things or I didn't do these five things. And here was the, the financial upside. You'd hate to think it's always financial. You're gonna to wanna to find some clinical outcome that balances that out. But I don't think we've used technology in, 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 in a uh, effective enough way to really kind of bring it into value-based care. Great, good point. Okay, we've got a great question. Oh, John Easter, old friend of EHI. Hi, John. Um, <laughs> how about team-based care with pharmacists helping with complex patients, the usefulness of medication claims? What about those medication claims? Yeah, Jen, I got to feel, I, I feel like I got to answer on this one. Our performance, yeah. particularly in Medicare, is entirely because of the pharmacists that we have on our team. Uh, adherence is absolutely something that uh, our PharmDs, PharmTechs, and others have really solely been responsible for. And in most of our MA products, we've performed really well on the medication adherence uh, metrics. And it's absolutely because we have PharmDs working side by side with all other clinicians. And it's in some cases now getting to that whole idea of getting the claims and then understanding, is there an alternative medication that may be more efficacious? Is there an alternative medication that be more economical? Uh, I don't know how anyone does value-based care without having 
uh, a group of pharmacists working shoulder to shoulder with other members of the team. Great answer. <laughs> Great to hear. I, I would I would second that 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 you know and going back to that first you know VBC what do you do first okay what second literally get a uh, an RX dump and you know start at people who are eight drugs and start chasing it down to those that are down on you know two hundred three you know you'll slow down somewhere around four um, and get people to um, therapeutic level. And it's the pharmacist who's going to negotiate that between the cardiologist and the nephrologist and then neurologist and, you know, therapeutic level. There's so much wasted medication going down the drain, which is not really the extent. I've, I've had conversations where pharm pharmacists come to me, oh, we'll take risk. And I'm like, great, your medication caused my person to go inpatient for, you know, three weeks and it's a $40,000 bill. You know, you're going to take that risk, and they're like, "Oh, oh no, we're talking about ingredient risk." And like, I'm not, I don't care, right? I, I, I want help <laughs> in getting my patients to therapeutic level, right? And if they get to therapeutic level, there's 60 admissions per thousand in that step right there. And if you're a numbers person, that's a big step. Mm -hmm. so. We've got a question here about um, discussing the critical player in value-based care, the patient, which I know actually, Michael, I heard you talk about earlier when you said the first thing you should do is get your 90 patients and go talk to them. So um. <laughs> glad this question is here because I want to turn yeah. it upside down. Okay. And, and right. So stop it. Right. There are three words at the bottom of my list that I don't ever want to be used to describe me. Dead, bankrupt, and a patient. Hmm. These are beneficiaries. Do not call people what they don't want to be called. Words matter. You want to engage with beneficiaries, you engage with beneficiaries. Calling them a patient and continuing to call them a patient only reminds them that they're sick, you perceive them as sick, and they're not really a full member of their team. They're the object, not a member of the team. So, you know, bang, call them beneficiaries, treat them as beneficiaries, as part of the team, not an object of the team. Okay, Take point taken. All right, we've got about a minute left here. Um, so Rebecca, Dev, Michael, I'd love you each to give me just kind of your, uh, 10 seconds words of advice, if you can do it in, in, in uh, you know, what are your quick words of advice? Um, Deb, why don't we start with you for folks trying to do this? Um, quick word of advice, it's a long game. If you're uh, looking to do value-based care with the idea of short-term wins, you may achieve them, but you really gotta have a long picture. And sometimes that's hard when we work in a 12 month uh, financial cycle. Perfect, Michael. Quick wins. It's a long game, but it starts with a very quick journey. Great. Rebecca, you get the last word here. Well, I, I have to, on behalf of Trellis, say get out of your own echo chamber. Start looking more broadly, mm -hmm. understand what's going on in the market, have a view that's more broad than just the silo that you live in, because you'll learn so much more. You'll have ideas. There's, there's some great data and great opportunities out there. And when you can look at the market, understand what your other your competitors, your, your cohorts are doing, um, you'll, you'll grow faster. Excellent. And I want to thank all three of you today. This has been a really robust conversation and um, really, I wish we had another hour to, to dive in here. I appreciate it. I want to also thank Rebecca and Trella. Thanks for supporting the program today. We appreciate it. Deb, Michael, very well done. Folks, if you're on, please go fill out your survey so we can know what you thought about the program today. And thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Have a great afternoon, everybody. <laughs>